All right, Brother Joel, would you pass out those leaflets for me? I feel like maybe we'll start a little series tonight, unless the Lord changes our mind. We may continue a little study through the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This is a powerful chapter. There's a lot in it. We won't cover all of chapter 1 nearly this, more, this afternoon, this evening. I think we'll be reading verses 1 through 10 tonight. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ... By the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Coloss, grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray, Lord, that you will help us tonight to expound the word, to bring uh, the meaning, to bring the understanding of it. Father, we pray, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us tonight. Give us help from on high. Open the windows of heaven, Father. Pour out upon us tonight your Spirit. Fill us, O Lord, with your fullness tonight that we might be instruments in your hand. And Lord, for all that you do for us, we'll give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. The town of Colossus, or the city of Colossus, by the time that Paul was writing this letter, is somewhere past its heyday, according to the historians. But it was originally on a trade route between Ephesus and the Euphrates area, and so because it was along that major trade route, it was at one time a very prosperous place, a very, probably a very large city. It was prosperous until the 8th century, but then was destroyed in the 12th century by the Turks. It was located just about 11 or 12 miles from Laodicea. You remember that name from the book of Revelation. Now Laodicea was on one side of this river that passed through that area, and Hierapolis was on the other side of the river. But Paul, in, uh, in, as far as we know, as best we can tell from his writings, he never was physically present in any of those churches in that particular area. He was at Ephesus, but he did not go down into that area as far as we know, as far as I can understand, at least. And so Paul here is writing, again, from prison, but <clears throat> at least in parts of his prison incarceration, he was given quite a few luxuries, one of which was to entertain friends, 
have guests, have people come see him. And so Epaphras has traveled from Colossus to Rome, and he has shared with the Apostle Paul how well this church is doing. Isn't that a good thing? A good report. <laughs> a good report of the church. He took back to Rome, and uh, it's probably, I mean, most of the scholars believe that probably Epaphras was, uh, was the one who founded this church, possibly. If not, he was the current, probably the current leader. And he gives the church here a threefold commendation. Threefold commendation. He said, <clears throat> since we heard, verse 4, of your faith in Christ Jesus. Their faith. They had put their entire trust and confidence in Jesus Christ. And it showed. It manifested itself. It was evident that they believed in Jesus. And you know, that ought to be the way we're striving for, is that our faith would become evident. Someone said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When necessary, use words. I like that phrase. I like that thought. I like the fact that our faith can be seen in how we act and how we react. Our faith can be seen in how we conduct business. Amen? What I'm saying is, I really want to live out my faith. I really want people to see my faith. And then, church at Colossus, had received something by faith and their faith in God became evident until the pastor would says, he says, I give thanks to God and been praying for you ever since I heard of your faith in Jesus. Lord, help us tonight that others would see our faith in Jesus. The second commendation was their love for the brethren and the love which you have to all saints. Lord, this ought to be our calling card. This ought to be by the thing by which we are known. Said, so do you want to be known as an old-fashioned Christian? Yes. Do you want to be known as a holiness man? Yes. But the Bible never says by those things would all men know you're my disciples. The Bible does say, if you have love one to another, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. I want an evident love, don't you? I want an evident faith. I want an evident love that God has put something in my heart for you and you for me and you all for each other. You know, the church has been, has been torn apart by internal schisms. Our movement has been shredded by internal schisms until the world knows us as church splitters. People that can't get along. Like the proverbial guy on the island all by himself. Someone went to rescue him. Found out there was two church buildings. You've heard that funny story. I don't think it's probably true. But it illustrates somewhat that, you know, he said, what's that? He said, that's the church I used to go to. This is the church I go to now, and only by himself. <laughs> That's getting pretty bad, isn't it? But we're, are we nearly to that point in our movements in some places and situations? We're just, we're just torn by division and schism. But the church at Colossus was evidently united at this point at least in love and harmony. And that should be our goal. That should be our goal. Yes, I do want to be holy. Yes, I do want to keep myself clean. And yes, I do want to keep the church going that direction. Yes, yes, yes. And I intend to by the help of the Lord. But if I don't do it in love, it's not going to profit one thing. And if you don't do it in love, it's not going to profit one thing. You know, there's, there's this thing about the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's very powerful. If I give my body to be burned and have not love, 
the, in, the King James is charity. It's divine love. It's agape. It's the love that God has for us. If I give my body to be burned and have not that divine love in my heart, it profiteth me nothing. If I have all wisdom and understand all mysteries and have not love, it profiteth nothing. Friend, if we give all of our goods to the poor and, and, and to try to feed the hungry, what a noble thing. But if we don't do it with divine love in our heart, it's all nothing Sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, the apostle said. So how important is this loving one another? It's vital. It's, it's crucial that we love one another, that we pray for one another, hold one another up, and trust God to meet the needs. Amen. So the church at Colossus, the second, first commendation was their faith was evident. The second commendation was their love was evident. And then thirdly, their hope, they had a hope. They were anchored in hope that this life was not the end of this thing. We have a home eternal in the heavens. Do you believe that? Is there a heaven to gain? Or is it just a hell to shun? <laughs> there is both. But you know, we need to let the world know that we have a richer inheritance. This world is not my home, the songwriter said. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I just don't feel at home in this world anymore. Don't you wish I could sing that? I do too. You know, it's, it's a wonderful message in song. This world is not my home. I have a hope. I have a hope. If I die tonight, I have a hope of seeing Jesus. I have a hope of a new body that don't hurt. I have a hope of not needing things like these. God, give us a hope. Help us to look at our hope and see this is something worth talking about. I like what John said in the 14th chapter of John. Do you have that memorized? He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. That's a wonderful hope, isn't it not? He said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. And this faith and this love produces a hope that becomes evident. It's just like this lady that she keeps testifying about, the McElwain sister. The doctors don't know what to do with her. She's not living for this world. She's not operated by this world. There's a higher power operating in her life that they can't understand. They can't explain it. Because it wasn't in the medical book. But it's in this book. <laughs> There's a power, friend. There is a name that's above every name. And that the name of Jesus. Jesus is coming back for a church. You believe it? Amen. Do you have a hope of going with him? Do you have a hope of a new home, a new body, a new name, a white robe, and a stone with your new name written in it. So what's that all about? I don't know. <laughs> but I intend by the grace of God to find out if God intended to think it valuable enough to mention it in his word, it's going to be valuable enough for you to go check it out. I don't know what the white stone with the new name in it signifies. I really don't. I've read some opinions. None of them really turned my well over, but uh, I believe that heaven will be worth it all. So why? You like to walk on gold streets? I don't know. I never have. Wouldn't be the gold streets that would be the main attraction for me? Said, ever walk through gates of pearl? No, I never have. And that wouldn't be the main attraction for me, though I believe it'll be very beautiful. And I believe it'll be very welcoming and very accommodating to be able to enter the city that God has prepared for them that love him. God designed this place for his children. God built this place for his children. Do you have a hope of going there tonight? Do you have a hope of going there where God has provided a place for you? Friend, if heaven is anything like 
the picture we get in the book of Revelation, it's going to be out of this world. <laughs> Beyond anything. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him. He reveals some things. The next verse says, according to his spirit, he reveals to us some things. But I haven't seen the splendor of that city. I haven't smelled the flowers or heard the beautiful harmony. I haven't listened to the beautiful music of heaven yet. But I believe it's there. I believe it's going to be worth the trip. But I'm so glad, and we're not even going to get through the introduction tonight. But Epaphras' commendation of this church is a phenomenal commendation. I think it's something every church ought to strive to have a name that our faith is working. Our love is working. And our hope of heaven and eternity with God is working in our lives. And I think if it is, friend, it'll have an impact. And he said he, he blesses them for these graces. And he says, which is coming to you. The, the truth of the gospel, verse 6, picks up that same thought. It's, there's a semicolon at the end of verse 5. He said, the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit. Should not the gospel still bring forth fruit? Amen. Amen. And uh, these converts to Christ out of paganism, out of heathenism, out of idolatry, these were converts at Colossus to biblical Christianity, if I can put it that way. And the reason they are converts in this record from Epaphras is because they heard the gospel message. How important is it to get the gospel out? How important is it to share the gospel message? You know, we ought to be advocating that. We ought to be promoting that. We ought to be sharing that with everyone we can. Oh, that, you know, when you find someone, I, I gave uh, my website card to this district manager. And when I saw him for the second time, he sold me the product. And then, then later I come back and did the transaction. Well, when he had to come back and deal with the problems I had that day, he said, I've been on your website. And we sat for a good 30, 35 minutes and talked Bible. He said, what do you mean by the sanctity of marriage? And I shared with him that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. I won't go into all of that. You know what I believe. You know what we teach and preach. It's a lifelong covenant and a lifelong union between a man and a woman. And I was explaining that to him. So remember, he came out of Jehovah Witnesses. And so we had a good time talking Bible, had a good time sharing with him the good things of God, talked about the Sabbath. He said, do you believe you still have to keep the Sabbath? I said, absolutely. I said, the Sabbath was not part of the Mosaic Law. The Sabbath was the first institution in creation. After six days, God rested and sanctified the seventh day and hallowed it, and he rested that day, and he made it a special delight. God created the Sabbath in creation. And he's kind of he's looking at me, you know. So where, where did all this come from? I don't know. But anyway, he's got a hungry heart and he wants to talk and we're going we're gonna to talk. We're going to get together. Sharing the gospel is what Christianity is all about. Yes. Talking to people about Jesus. Giving tracts to people about Jesus. Giving your church card. Giving the internet address where they can hear the messages. Had a brand new subscriber this week. The only reason I got on Facebook, I, I downed Facebook for years, but I realized I'm on there to share with them scriptures, and I'm on there to share with them the website and the YouTube channel, where there's 127 or 30 messages already of divine truth, and who knows who's going to hear. The guy that subscribed this way, I've never heard of him in my life. I don't know who he is. 
But everybody that shares one of my links, it opens it up to all of their friends. And then their friends of their friends. It's, an, it's a tool that, I don't, you know, it's a dangerous thing. If you get on and just spend time gossiping and, and telling everybody what you had for breakfast, that's a bunch of nonsense. Okay? I don't do that. They don't have any idea what I had for breakfast. They don't know, I don't post where I'm at throughout the day so that everybody can keep up with me. That's nonsense. But every few days I post a scripture. Every few days the word of God is put on there. And once in a while, like the, the revival was on there. Brother Storer's testimony, a link to it was on there. Got over 30 some comments on my blog page. Praising God of what he could do for this man. I posted his uh, Sunday morning testimony the other day, and I think within a half a day I had 30-some views. Now, that's not viral or anything. That's not making anybody rich. <laughs> but it's more than we had in church. Well, no, not quite. We had 44. But it almost doubled just in a few hours what heard it here. That's why I'm online. That's why I use the Internet, okay? Okay. A world of hurt if you get off somewhere. But if you use it to spread the gospel. The, the Ten Commandments series that we did right here, we posted those, or most of them. I didn't start recording, I think, until the fourth one. I didn't really think about it, and I didn't tell Ronnie to record it until I think we started the fourth commandment. But the, that series on adultery, those four messages on adultery, have created and generated a lot of comments. Several preachers said, brother, said, we don't hear it like this. You're telling the truth. There's people out there that want truth. But listen, if we don't get the word out, how are they going to hear without the gospel? How are they going to believe without the gospel? Friends, it's time to get the gospel out. Brother Gilbert used to paint hand-painted signs. Uh, Jesus saves and, and go along the, the roadway and climb up in the tree and nail them to a tree. Jesus saves. You've seen these fanatics that have the bumper stickers all over their cars, the scripture verses, and, and we look at them like they're really nuts. Well, maybe they're not. And I'm not telling you you have to put stickers all over your car, but I'm saying we need to be sharing the gospel. We need to be sharing the gospel because that's what touched their heart. It's by the word of God, friends, that people are saved. It's by the foolishness of preaching that the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the comic stories. No. Hearing by the latest news report. No. Hearing by the latest commentary from somebody. No. Hearing the word of God. This is the word of God. Is there any reason we can't get it out? We're still free people. Leave a tract. Leave a Sunday school paper. Leave a verbal testimony. Lord, help us. I want to be like the church at Colossae. I want to be commended. I want to be commended. He says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. You know, there is so much error out there. There is so much falsehood out there. I felt sorry for Melvin today. I would feel sorry for any professing Christian that didn't understand and had not been taught clearly that you can know. Your sins are gone. But there's a world of people that have been misinformed and uninformed. And we have the truth. Amen. We have the message. You must be born again. You must repent and believe the gospel if you're going to be saved. You must get out of the sin business if you're going to walk with God. Amen? Amen? Well, this is Wednesday night, but that's pretty good preaching, I think. You know, the Lord sent a progress report to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Laodicea being one of them. 
The things they were doing well, he commended them for. The things that they were lacking, he reproved them for. If the Lord was keeping a progress report on the seven churches of Asia Minor, do you reckon he might still be keeping a progress report on his churches? He said he hadn't sent any letters to Community Bible Church that we know about. What if he did? Just stop and think. What if God sent a letter to us and you just use yourself, don't try to put anybody else in, just use yourself. Lord, if you were sending a letter about the spiritual status of the Community Bible Church, according to me, according to me, you stop and think, stop and ask yourself, what would that letter say? Would it be all commendations like it was for Philadelphia? Or would it be 50-50? I hope it wouldn't be all negative. I don't think it would. But you know, God is looking on. God is concerned about what we're doing as a church. And I want to please him, don't you? And the Apostle Paul, this stirred him so much. This impressed him so much, though he had never seen them face to face. He said, I pray for you daily. And we'll get into some of the rest of it, what he's praying for. That's another message all by itself, is how Paul prays for the church at Coloss. And you can study that out and pray about it. And read the outline if you'd like. Pray the Lord to guide us and direct us as far as the messages and the truth he wants delivered. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and if I know my heart, I'll preach anything he lays on my heart. But uh, let's, let's pray that the Lord will give divine direction to the services, and not just to the preacher, and not just to the Sunday school teacher, not just to the song leader, but to every one of us. We would know how, what God wants us to do, if anything, in the service, to mind him, to praise him. Amen? Let's, let's really... In 2020, let's ask for the kind of vision. You know, 2020 is a vision number. That's the number you want if you have vision, is you want a 2020 vision. You want to be able to see clearly. You want to be able to see distinctly. That'd make a good motto for this year, wouldn't it? God give us 2020 spiritual vision. Till we can see ourselves, we can see the harvest field, we can see the needs around about us. We can see the urgency of the matter. There's so many things. I could preach another message on those three or four points, but I won't. So let's, let's go for a commendation. Let's go for a commendation. Lord, we want your commendation on our church. So we're going to have a faith that is evident, a love for one another that's evident, and a hope that is evident. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for the folks that are here. We miss some that are not here. We miss the folks that live so far away that they can't come at night. And Father, we just pray you'll bless those and touch the, the group, Lord, that's somewhere between almost being persuaded to serve the Lord. Father, that group that comes occasionally, and Lord, you know their heart, you know their need. I pray that you'll save them. I pray, Lord, that you'll touch their hearts tonight. I pray that you'll encourage the saints and touch the bodies of our people that are sick or hurting. Lord, we pray again that you'll just manifest your power and presence here on the Lord's Day in the services this coming weekend. And Lord, for all you do for us, we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.